The British were not in a good place in 1942. World War II in the Atlantic had been raging for years. The German U-boats had been making easy work of their esteemed navy, and the materials needed to replace their lost ships were running low. They needed a solution to help turn the tide of war. Enter Project Tabaku. This venture would give them the secret weapon they needed to gain the upper hand on the German submarines. All they had to do was build an aircraft carrier out of ice. This project eventually gained the backing of a royal family member and Winston Churchill himself. The HMS Habakkuk would be four times larger than the Titanic and able to carry over 300 aircraft. This is its incredible story. So, it's 1942 and Geoffrey Pike was working for the British government on a solution to the danger British ships faced in U-Boat Alley. This stretch of the Atlantic Ocean was a hotbed for German submarines sinking Allied ships. Pike took into account the shortage of materials needed to make warships like steel and considered the possibility of building ships out of more readily available resources. His thinking led him to the most abundant resource on the planet – water. At that time, ice was seen as indestructible. The International Ice Patrol reported that blowing up icebergs was extremely difficult. This convinced Pike that ice would be the perfect material for a warship. Geoffrey Pike already had a bit of a reputation for being eccentric, some even going so far as to label him crazy. His past work ranged from a screw-propelled vehicle to help transport troops through snowy terrains, to a survey administered by British spies to German citizens in the guise of casual conversation to gauge the German population's appraisal of Hitler. Project Abarkuk did little to distance Pike from his peculiar reputation. His original idea included cutting off a chunk of an iceberg, hollowing out the center, and flattening the top so that planes could could take off and land. This proposal did not make it past the drawing board. First, the space a cargo jet or heavy bomber needs to take off and land 2,000 feet would make the iceberg chunk absolutely massive, making it hard for the team to find a feasible iceberg to use without shelling out large sums of money to tow one in from the ocean. Second, the way an iceberg floats puts a majority of its mass below water. I'm sure you've heard the term the tip of the iceberg before. For an aircraft carrier to effectively field landing and departing planes, it has to be a certain height above water, 50 feet to be exact. On average, an iceberg has about 90% of its mass underwater. Meeting that benchmark would mean having at least 500 feet of ice below the water, severely compromising its maneuvering capability. Third, icebergs were simply unpredictable, known to flip over unexpectedly, making their feasibility as a ship precarious at best. Thankfully, Pike's ideas were refined, and the team was able to plan to use blocks of ice to construct the ship instead. Original plans for the HMS Abarco had walls measuring 40 feet thick to ensure resistance to torpedoes, and they were equipped with over 40 dual barrel gun turrets and anti aircraft guns. The plans for HMS Abarcook were drawn up and presented to the higher-ups for approval. Lord Mountbatten, Chief of Combined Operations, had developed a bit of a liking for Pike based on his previous work. He took Pike to meet Winston Churchill. The Prime Minister, thinking he had found his secret weapon against the German U-boats, approved the project. But the British needed help from experts in coal, so of course, they turned to their allies in Canada. The British-Canadian team started the project at Lake Patricia in Alberta, Canada. They chose this location for its proximity to a readily available source of labor, a conscientious objectors camp, although these men were told very little about the project's purpose. After initial tests, Pike quickly realized that ice alone was too brittle for a warship. Building an aircraft carrier the size of the proposed Barcook would, as Pike put it, cause the ship to sag under its own weight. A combination of good timing and novel scientific thinking led Pike to develop a new substance to save his ship. He came across a report by American scientists who had mixed water and wood pulp, then frozen it and made a stronger ice-like material. Pike took this finding and tweaked it to make the material even stronger. His tests found that the optimal mixture was 14% sawdust and 86% water. At this ratio, it proved to be resistant to chipping, compression, and bullets. Further experiments showed that it was tougher than concrete and reached 14 times the strength of ice. It also melted much more slowly than ice and had a greater buoyancy. The team named it Pycrete after their leader. 
A ship using pikerite would need an extensive cooling system to maintain the optimal temperature. However, Pike was pleased enough with his material to take it to his boss. Lord Mountbatten, in turn, took the new material to Churchill for approval. According to a story in Pike's biography attributed to Mountbatten, he arrived at the country home of Churchill, and he was told the Prime Minister was in the bath. Mountbatten apparently barged into the bathroom and threw a block of pikerite into the steaming tub. The stunned Churchill stared at the floating block. Once the outer layer of ice had melted, the wood pulp and ice mixture in the middle remained floating. Churchill recommended Mountbatten take Pikerite to the Quebec conference to show the rest of Allied leadership. Lord Mountbatten decided to showcase the material's strength with another practical demonstration. In the meeting, that also included President Roosevelt and top Allied military officers, Mountbatten placed a block of pure ice and a block of Pikerite on a table. He pulled out a gun and shot the ice block, which shattered. He then turned the gun on the block of pikerite and pulled the trigger. The bullet ricocheted off, grazing the leg of Admiral King, the commander-in-chief of the U.S. Naval Fleet. It left only a small dent in the pikerite. Despite an angered American admiral, the Allied leadership approved its use. The prototype took the shape of a shoebox. The body of the ship was constructed from blocks of pikerite, interlaced throughout the ship was a frame of refrigeration piping. Whereas the final iteration of HMS Abarkuk would measure nearly 4,000 feet or 1,200 meters long and 600 feet or 180 meters wide and would displace 2.2 million tons of water, the prototype was only 60 feet 18 meters long and 30 feet 9 meters wide and weighed 1,000 tons. Once it was complete, it was time for the prototype's maiden voyage. Pike's team launched the boat and test the vessel's readiness for war. By the end of the test, it survived numerous munition rounds and explosive tests. The success of the prototype pleased Churchill and spurred him to order the construction of the full-scale ship. However, the project soon encountered rough waters. Soon after starting construction, Pike and his team realized that they would be limited by the scarcity of essential materials their project was meant to avoid. The massive size of the ship meant the ice blocks needed support from a steel frame in addition to the refrigeration piping, and making enough pikerite blocks would require huge amounts of wood. Steel and wood were already in short supply, making it incredibly difficult to obtain the vast amounts needed. In fact, when the calculations were done, the Habakkuk ended up needing more steel than a conventional aircraft carrier. Concerns also arose regarding the ship's size and maneuverability. It was feared that the HMS Abarca would be too cumbersome to navigate through the treacherous waters of the North Atlantic, outweighing the potential benefits offered by the ship's sheer size and the Pikerite strength. As the war progressed, the Allies found alternative strategies to counter German U-boats. Around the same time, the British cracked the Enigma Code and Portugal approved Allied air bases on their coast. These developments made air patrols more feasible and accurate in countering enemy submarines. This changed the perception of a massive ice ship like Habakkuk from one of urgent need to an interesting endeavor. The ultimate downfall of the project was the cumulative investment it required, both financial and human. The ship's cost had tripled to over 2.5 million pounds, or the equivalent of 150 million pounds today. As the Pacific theater of war gained prominence, American focus shifted towards allocating resources and manpower to combat the Japanese instead. Without American support, the British-Canadian team did not have the resources to carry out their ambitious plans. To top things off, as this laundry list of complications came to light, Lord Mountbatten, Pike's original cheerleader, became unenthused about the project's potential and eventually withdrew his support altogether. In a meeting at the end of 1943, Allied leaders decided to abandon the project. To the project's credit, though, the prototype stood strong through three hot Canadian summers before the Pike Reed finally melted and the frame sank to the bottom of Lake Patricia. One of the most remarkable legacies of Project Abarkuk is the invention of Pikerite. Outside of Project Abarkuk, artists have been using it to create breathtaking ice sculptures, while engineers and artists have utilized Pikerite in ice domes and even boats, though on a much smaller scale. In a testimony to Pikerite's legacy, the popular television show Mythbusters dedicated an entire episode to testing it, even building their own Pikerite boat. The show confirmed the claims of Pikerite's exceptional strength and bullet-resistant properties. While they deemed the concept of a fully functioning Pikerite ship plausible but ludicrous, the episode showcased the astonishing possibilities of Pikerite. As for Jeffrey Pike, like the visionary behind the project, his grand design and continued after the project's end, he pursued numerous ambitious ideas, including an extensive tube system attached to a troop carrier ship meant to help soldiers land more safely on Japanese-held islands. However, many of Pike's post-war ventures, including the troop tube, remained only concepts. 
On February the 21st, 1948, at the age of 54, Pike was found dead by his landlady, having swallowed an entire bottle of sleeping pills. When his body was found, he was lying on top of papers that he'd been writing on. Some speculate that Pike was delving into a topic that even the great Albert Einstein had yet to ponder, a mathematical formula concerning the space-time continuum. Today, the site of the remains of HMS Abarkirk in Lake Patricia stands as a destination for intrepid divers. The location has a commemorative plaque that informs those who reach its depths only that the wreckage was a secret World War II project in involving the use of ice in ship construction. Project Abarkirk's mark on history remains a testament to human ingenuity and the lengths that we'll go to to win a war.